Essex demoralised staff refuse to investigate. Martin North, John Adams, in the interests of the people. Hello again. Well, I wanted to share with you another of the series of presentations made as part of the Senate inquiry this last week. And this one is another killer insofar that it really gets to the heart of ASIC's cultural problems. So once again, Senator Bragg is leading the questioning and I'll leave you to listen to the conversation. Okay, the committee will resume and I now welcome Mr. Bill O'Chi. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses giving evidence to Senate committee has been provided to you. For the hands record, could you please state your full name and capacity in which you appear? Uh, my name is William George O'Chi. I'm a former uh, senator and I am uh, appearing uh, in my own right uh, as a management consultant. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have an opening statement, Mr O'Chi? Uh, uh, yes, with the uh, indulgence of the committee, I'd like to make a few observations as I have not had the opportunity to prepare a, a submission uh, due to the short time. And I'd like to begin by um, expressing my uh, gratitude and appreciation of the privilege and honour that the committee has given to me in asking me to provide evidence to them. I'd like to begin by saying or um, exhorting the committee not to make the same mistake that the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee made 30 years ago in examining the investigative powers of the then Australian Securities Commission. And what do I mean by that? Uh, the uh, inquiry which ran for almost three years in the 90s was initiated by uh, concerns about the failings of the administrative of the investigative functions of the ASC, uh, and initially, and initially, it arose out of something called Ostom Investments. But the mistake we made was we became, as legislators, we became captives of the legislation, and instead of looking at the big picture, we became too focused on what changes needed to be made to this section or that section in the belief that that would solve the problem. 30 years has gone by. The investigative and enforcement practices of ASIC are no better and arguably worse than the investigative and enforcement practices of its predecessor 30 years ago. Um, and so that's the basis on which I would urge senators not to become captive of the legislation, but instead to look at the big picture and say, what are we trying to achieve? So I would st start by saying there is a difference between insolvency and investigation. A lot of the comments I'm going to make are about insolvency, but they apply also to investigation. And the, the difference between preemptive investigation and insolvency investigation is merely a point in time that certain things have happened which have made the company insolvent and external administrator is appointed. But you're often dealing with potentially the same offences, and I use the word offences um, in a loose sense. I would actually prefer to call them financial crimes, and I'll get on to that later. The role of insolvency law is twofold. It is, first of all, to ensure economic efficiency. And secondly, it's to ensure justice. And when I use the word justice, I, I think in terms of what the Emperor Justinian said um, in the sort of seventh century, that justice is the constant and perpetual desire to render to each person that which is their due. For reasons that will become obvious as I go through this, it is very clear that ASIC is not rendering justice to the victims of financial crime. Now, this is also a problem because insolvency law is necessary to ensure that 
what are essentially moribund assets are repurposed and that um, monies which are owing by corporations are repaid to creditors so that they can then be put into the efficient operation of the economy. And so I think it's appropriate to look at, when we look at insolvency, and remember insolvency cases are just part of the broad gamut of financial crime in Australia for which ASIC notionally has responsibility. I think it's really, really useful to look at ASIC's own statistics. And I note the opening statement made by the chair of ASIC to this committee earlier on this year, uh, in which it was said, well, you know, ASIC is both proactive and, and sort of retrospective. Uh, let's look at how effectively ASIC deals with the retrospective aspect. That is, when a company has gone into administration, there is an external administrator appointed. So you've already got an independent investigator digging into the company and making a report. And the statistics I'm going to use come from a report 645 by ASIC, which is insolvency statistics, external administrators reports for the year 2018-19. Now, I do apologise to the committee in the short period of time. I haven't had a chance to produce this material for you, but... I'm happy to give an undertaking to actually pull this stuff out and put it into a single document that will be available. What is the extent of the losses involved in companies which become insolvent? If you go to table uh, 34 of report 645, uh, it, it, it lists all that the broad gamut of deficiencies of assets to liabilities in companies. Now, I've applied a um, normal distribution analysis of this, and I've arrived at the very conservative estimate that in 2018-19, the deficiency of assets to liabilities in companies, which is the amount to which creditors are being ripped off because they are owed money and they will never be repaid at this money. The extent of those debts was over $8 billion in 2018-19. Now, let's put that into perspective. People get very worked up over cybercrime. Cybercrime in the 21 22 year, I think, was estimated at $3.1 billion. Now, for a whole heap of reasons, which I'll outline when I write something, my estimate is extremely conservative. And the most important reason is that in many cases, the company has not maintained adequate books and records, and so the administrator cannot get full extent of, of the debts that the company has racked up. And in Table 28, I believe, um, no, sorry, in Table, uh, there's another table, I don't have the number, I do apologise, $1 billion of those debts were owed in the form of taxes and unpaid Commonwealth charges. So the Commonwealth is losing $1 billion a year in deficiencies of assets to liabilities. The other thing is that this overhangs the economy because if money is owed to banks because of the way banks have much higher uh, loan books than the actual Basel III or Basel IV assets, if you um, have a dollar in losses, it tends to wipe out about $6 of of actual bank capital. So it's pretty important that we get this right. Now, let's look at the statistics around offences. And again, I'm going to use uh, Report 645, and I'm going to refer to tables 
13 and 14. So Table 13 said that administrators reported to ASIC 16,874 breaches of civil obligations in that year. They reported 772 uh, alleged criminal offences that occurred prior to appointment. They alleged 2,154 criminal offences that occurred after appointment. So most of those will be failure to provide books and records to an administrator or a liquidator. And they alleged 185 other offences. Now, what happens to those reports which are made by an administrator? They go into what's called the liquidator's um, uh, um, online portal. And I think the committee would be aware that ASIC uses a computer algorithm to determine which reports should, be, should result in a request for supplementary information, a supplementary report. Now, it's a long time since I've been in Parliament, so I'm, I'm not partisan. Uh, I will say that I think robo-debt was wrong. It was wrong because it subordinated important decisions about people's lives to computers. That is ethically wrong. The role of government is to be just. And if robo-debt was wrong in the way in which it operated, then ASIC's use of a computer algorithm to determine which cases are subject to further investigation is equally wrong because it fails to do justice to the victims of financial crime. I don't need to say any more about that. Now, in 77.9% of cases, the administrator indicated in the report to ASIC that he or she had documentary evidence to support the allegations of offences. 77.9% of cases, the administrator has already identified and holds documentary evidence to show the offences occurred. And in 34.8% of cases, the administrator recommended further investigation by ASIC. So that is 2,613 cases. Now, the problem is that ASIC doesn't follow up. Uh, if you go to table, and just to get an understanding of the extent of these matters, in table, 50, in table 15, there were 561 reports of alleged offences in companies where the deficiency of assets to liabilities was between $1 and $5 million. There were 77 cases where the deficiency of assets to liabilities was 5 to $10 million. And there were 69 cases where the deficiency of assets to liabilities was over $10 million. But what has ASIC done with this? Uh, if you go to the 2018 19 report, they Acknowledge that there were seven thousand, there were eight thousand one hundred and six reports from ins from insolvency practitioners that year. There were seven thousand two hundred and twenty seven alleged breaches. There were five hundred and fifteen supplementary reports received alleging breaches. So, you, you know, you've got the initial reports and the supplementary reports. In 87% of those supplementary reports, ASIC took no action. And 
in 14% of cases where there was a supplementary report, 13% of cases, action was at, was taken. But that results in only 1.8% of cases where there is an alleged criminal offence actually being investigated by ASIC. And that is simply not good enough. No matter how ASIC spins it, it is not good enough because it is not doing justice to the victims of financial crime. And when you look at the numbers, so you've got 515 supplementary reports, you've got 13% of that. We're not even, it would barely be enough to touch the cases over $10 million. So what is the solution? The solution is to treat these offences as financial crimes and have them investigated, or ones over a certain threshold, investigated by a financial crimes unit inside the Australian Federal Police. Because the AFP already do investigate financial crime, particularly cybercrime, and other types of crime. ASIC will say, and have said in the past, that they have particular skill sets and expertise that make them the appropriate people to investigate matters to do with the Corporations, uh, the Companies Act, the Corporations Act. I will say that's just not true. On the basis of this evidence, they, sh they lack neither the expertise nor the willpower nor the capacity to do the investigations. Their excuse will be that they use a risk analysis framework to determine the cases. Well, they don't. They're not really measuring risk. They're certainly not measuring risk to consumers. It's actually a convenience test. And the reality will be that in most cases, you will not be prosecuted by ASIC unless you confess to having committed an offence. That's right. Um, and why should the Australian Federal Police do it? Because the Australian Federal Police have powers that ASIC don't have. So it's a lot easier for ASIC, sorry, a lot easier for the AFP to get a, a warrant to search premises than it is for an administrator or for ASIC. In ASIC's 2018-19 annual report, they indicate that they, they obtained only 66 search warrants and they related to only 13 cases. And that's because under the Corporations Act, you actually have to make an application in court to the federal court to obtain a search warrant. And you also have to obtain um, leave to make an ex parte application if you don't want the respondent to know you're about to exercise a search warrant. ASIC's normal course of conduct is to issue a notice to the director to produce books and records. But the effect of that, of course, <laughs> you know, if you give them seven or 14 days to produce the books and records, the books and records have disappeared. The federal police, however, can get a warrant by going on, on oath to a magistrate, and they don't have to seek leave for it to happen ex parte. Uh, they are very good at executing search warrants. I spoke with a colleague of mine a uh, former colleague of mine. Uh, she has been an insolvency practitioner for 25 years. She said insolvency practitioners almost never execute search warrants. She said she's only ever executed one search warrant in 25 years, and that was a search warrant she executed with me. But she's never done it since, and most of the insolvency practitioners she's spoken to have never done it because of the cost and difficulty of obtaining a search warrant. So the federal police are the right people, but they're also the right people because increasingly financial crime is international. So the AFP has links into Interpol that ASIC simply don't have. They also have the power to arrest directors. So I'd ask you, if you look at the FTX trial, which is happening in the US, that involved a company which collapsed in December last year. The directors of that 
are either being prosecuted or have already um, pled guilty to charges against them. If that happened in Australia, because there is no power to arrest, um, the directors would all be overseas and outside the jurisdiction. Um, so I think the case for taking it outside ASIC is very, very clear. Um, I have absolute confidence that you'll get better outcomes. And, you know, if we started to arrest miscreant directors, it would send a massive signal to people who are involved in financial crimes using companies that it's no longer good enough. And I'm going to end with one um, very simple explanation, and then I'm looking forward to taking questions. The whole reason for companies existing in the first place, if we go back to the 17th century, was to enable the aggregation of capital for investment. That's still the role that many companies play today, especially when investors are involved. As soon as you aggregate capital, you create a bigger target for corporate criminals. And if I was a criminal, I know I could get away with a lot more using a company than I could by defrauding under my own name, because you create a buffer between yourself and your, your offences. Uh, it makes it very easy to lose the records. But more importantly, you can get more victims quicker and in much greater amounts. So we now have to say, all right, well, uh, we have massive financial crimes involving corporations. It is now time to stop treating these criminals as gentlemen who should be given special treatment under the Corporations Act and instead treat them as the financial criminals they are and have them investigated by the AFP. And, and Mr Chairman, uh, on that note, I'll cease what was a long introduction. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr Oche. And thank you for making your time available today. I want to start by going back to the initial inquiry that you established back in May 1993. Um, so the basis of this inquiry was more than just complaints handling, though, wasn't it? There, there had been some significant uh, malfeasance at the time. Um, could you give a, a sense of how the AFC engaged with the Senate committee during that inquiry? I think the ASC engaged with the Senate committee in the same way that ASIC is engaging with the Senate committee now. In other words, they're saying, um, look, we do a wonderful job. I note uh, in one of the recent speeches that ASIC said they couldn't actually tell people how they did their job because that would, that would breach the security that they need to do their job. Um, but look, it, the conduct is the same. Okay. And... There were some matters that were ready to answer by you in around this time about a, a Mr and Mrs Bunt that you may recall, I know, or some time ago, so I don't want to stretch your memory um, too much, but they, these sound very similar to some of the matters we've canvassed in this inquiry in that it's been very difficult to obtain information from ASIC which actually shows how they go about their business of running an investigation. I believe in this case, uh, Mrs. Bunt had a section or underwent a section 19 transcript, which uh, I don't think she was able to get in the end. Is there anything you could tell us about this, uh, this secrecy? Yeah, look, in, in, uh, in the Ostom Investments case, and I remember it very well, um, what happened was uh, some criminals set up a series of investment trusts and they persuaded some of the directors, some of the investors that they should notionally be directors mm. of trustee companies, but they had no involvement in it at all. And the, the criminals uh, then moved money from one trust to another. So it's a, typical Ponzi scheme, in Ostom's, the trust deeds of at least one of the trusts were varied 
with the permission of the Corporate Affairs Commissioner in Victoria to enable funds to be commingled, uh, which was a massive, massive breach by the CAC of its, of its uh, duties to oversee the administration of the trust deeds. And then ASIC went after the investors, thinking that they were the promoters of the scheme because they were notionally directors uh, and uh, they were subjected to Section 19 examinations. Can I say, and I'm getting emotional here, the case of Mrs Bunt has haunted me for 30 years. Successive governments have failed, despite pleadings by me and others, to even apologise to Mrs Bunt and her husband who lost their life savings, who lost their home and lost their, their mental health. The, tre the treatment from the ASC was appalling and I think it is long overdue that a public apology is offered to Mrs Bunt by somebody in Parliament House. OK, and in the case of Mrs Bunt, was she able to get a handle, or was she able to obtain her Section 19 transcript in the end? I can't recall. I know she had great difficulty. I cannot recall. I do apologise. Yeah, OK. Um, because this idea that the investigative methods are, are secret uh, has troubled our committee throughout the course of our investigation. We haven't been able to understand exactly what law enforcement methods are so secret that they can't be told to the committee even in private. Do you have any... Can you help us with this at all? Oh, yes, I can, uh, because I've had many dealings, you know, over the years when I was winding up companies with ASIC. Um, Section 19 was used to compel people to give evidence. Um, they mismanaged it. Um, what they do is they get directors in, they require them to give evidence, but there's no real investigation because the investigation has largely already been conducted by the insolvency practitioner uh, because the insolvency practitioner is the one who has gathered up all the documents. There might be, I could imagine, theoretically imagine some circumstances where ASIC might be able to get some records that the insolvency practitioner couldn't. But the insolvency practitioner, because they are an officer of the company, have a power to issue notices to third parties who hold information to produce that information. So I, I, I bear the stretch to find any means of obtaining documentary evidence that is in favour of ASIC that does not exist in favour of the insolvency practitioner. Uh, on the whole, ASIC, you know, run off the information that's provided to them by the administrator or liquidator. Um, so I think that the idea that there is some sort of secret law enforcement method involved here is absolute bunkum. You don't think it's a Colonel Sanders-style secret source? Yeah, well, that's being polite. I prefer bunkum. Sorry. OK. So um, turning to the report um, that the Senate tabled back in, I think it was 95, the... Recommendation two went to the issue of complaints handling and the setting up of a, it looks like some sort of a structure inside the ASC. Um, so was that a core recommendation because there was a sense that people would go to ASIC from different parts of the community or ASC as it was then and the complaints would not be acted upon? Yes. Okay. That, that doesn't... I'm reading the government's response here from the mid-90s and it says here that the government did uh, adopt that recommendation, but uh, I can't see that function existing today in any material form. Well, and only 1.8% of alleged offences is any action taken by ASIC. That's clear from their own report. But there must have been for a time a mechanism inside the Commission to deal with complaints handling because of the political pressure that was placed on them at the time. 
Um, I, I think certain things were done, but remember, uh, the ASC continued on for a period of time after the 96 election, mm. and then it became ASIC. And if that mechanism existed and was functioning, it probably ceased to exist and or function after the creation of ASIC. So it disappeared. It looks like it, dis it disappeared after Twin Peaks. Yep. Do you have a, a sense of the success of Twin Peaks now? I mean, the general view has been that it has been better than many other structures, but the uh, ASIC itself seems to be granted more and more powers and more and more uh, a bigger and bigger remit by Parliament as the years go on. Well, granting more powers to ASIC doesn't work if they are only going to investigate less than 2% of cases. Also, and this is going to offend some people, it assumes that the people inside ASIC are the right people. So in discussions I've had over the last week with insolvency practitioners, they tell me that uh, the people inside ASIC uh, in the investigatory teams are thoroughly demoralised. I heard of a former colleague of mine who spent 12 months in ASIC and left in frustration because there was no desire to investigate anything. Um, I don't think that giving more powers or having more funding is the answer. You need to change the way in which we look at it. If you keep it in ASIC, you are still trapped within the framework of treating these financial criminals better than any other criminals. And if these criminals are responsible for, in, in, a, in, in an insolvency, you've got three reasons for insolvency. You've got outright crime, you've got incompetence, and you've just got, you know, some industries get cruel when the, the economy turns against them. But if you say, well, you know, 50% of this is criminal, then you're giving a, it's not even a get out of jail free card, it's get out of jail with a bounty card to people who are committing over eight, over $4 billion of, of criminal offences. Okay. Your solution here is that the AFP will be brought in to do the bulk of the investigation and then take it through to the Commonwealth DPP. Is that right? Yes. Um, they need to be given a power to um, explicit... Uh, authority to investigate offences under the Corporations Act. And then I, my recommendation would be, if you look at the numbers, that um, where you've got a deficiency of assets to liabilities, um, yeah. excess of, say, a million dollars, you're looking at uh, around about 700 cases. Yeah, okay. I guess that's what the threshold is. So, so given the, the, the committee... The legal and constitutional affairs, I think it was, from the mid-90s, ran the parallel inquiry. I mean, at that time, corporate law was vested in the AG's department, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. And what did you think about the AG's department's uh, capability to look at this area of corporate law and law enforcement? Well... I I will say that my colleagues and I were possibly a little bit naive in accepting some of the assurances. I hate to say it, but let's be honest. Um, I, I think we were too willing to accept assurances um, and, and with the benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't have gone that way. Okay. So in summary, your, your testimony and advice is that Reflecting upon the parallel inquiry from 30 years ago, um, it didn't look at the matters in a structural sense. It was too focused on shifting existing laws. That's correct. We were too focused on, on the operation of particular provisions of the Act, and we never really got to grips with corporate uh, corporate financial crime as corporate financial crime. Uh, and that's where I think we got it wrong. And I hate to say it, I think we let down the Australian public. At the time, we thought we had done a great job. 
and everybody said, oh, what a great report it was. But I think we got it wrong. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much, Mr. O.T., for taking the time to be with us today at the hearing. So there you have it. Yet more evidence about the lack of leadership and the cultural norms that are actually haunting ASIC at the moment. Time for radical transformation and change, as we've said before. Well, we'll probably come back with some more conversations about ASIC, but this at least gives you yet more food for thought. Once again, it confirms the hypothesis that John and I have been running with, that ASIC is simply not fit for purpose. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people, we'll see you next time.